<laughs> it is. Well, if I haven't met you yet, I'm Bob Horn. My wife Susie and I are really privileged to pastor a very beautiful church. I wish you could all just, why don't you just all come up here and look at, look at this church from, from here. It's, this perspective is really pretty neat. There's, there's some amazing people in this room. Beautiful church. It's a church that Jesus loves very, very much. And I'm so, so thankful that God said, you get to go to Yelm. It's been really good. We've been here about a month and a half, and um, I'm just, I'm amazed at God's goodness. So thanks for coming and worshiping with us this morning. This is a good place to, to get to know Jesus. This is a good place to worship Jesus. And um, I'm really thankful for the people that I get to worship with. So should we get into God's word? Yes. We are in a series called Sent in the Spirit. And the bottom line of this message series is this, is that to be the active presence of Jesus, we need the available power of the Holy Spirit. To be the active presence of Jesus, we need the available power of the Holy Spirit. And over the last several weeks, what we've been exploring is this available power that we have in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to give you a quick recap. I like recaps, you know, when you miss a, a TV show or you forget especially when like the new season starts and you're like, what the heck happened in season two? And they do that recap. Like this is my recap for you in case you missed last week or you forgot what it was we were, we've been doing. Here's the recap. So there is an experience available to every follower of Jesus that is in addition to and separate from our salvation experience. If you're a follower of Jesus, you had a moment in your life where you said, yes, Jesus, I want you in my life. I, I choose you to be my Savior, to be my Lord. That's your salvation experience. And then there's this experience that we're talking about with the Holy Spirit that's in addition to and separate from that, and it's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The word baptism in Greek is baptizo, and it means literally to me to be immersed to be immersed in the Holy Spirit. This is not a baptism uh, like a water baptism. You may have been baptized in water. Maybe uh, as a kid you were sprinkled or dunked, or you probably weren't dunked as an infant, but you were probably maybe perhaps sprinkled. Or, or, but there's a, there's a baptism in water. That's a separate, different action, activity. We're talking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, in that overwhelming love of God. That's this baptism of the Holy Spirit that we're talking about. And it's, we can ask Jesus to baptize us with the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit comes upon us and immerses us in His power. And He does this to provide boldness so we can be Jesus' active presence in the world. And the primary evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that power and boldness. And you see that in the, gospel, uh, in, in the book of Acts. You see the, the disciples being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and now they have this incredible power and boldness to share the gospel of Jesus to their world around them. That's the evidence that, that we see is we have, we have this boldness and power to share the life of Jesus and his gospel to those you encounter, bringing Jesus' presence through you to your world. Then the power shows up in different kinds of graces or, or supernatural abilities that the Holy Spirit gives us. We read about those in 1 Corinthians 12. There's a whole list. We talked about those a few weeks ago. Things like prophecy and words of wisdom and words of knowledge and distinguishing of spirits and miracles and healing and faith and tongues. And we talked about all those and broke it all down. Those are those special gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us with this power and boldness that comes. And then once more time, if we're to be the active presence of Jesus in our world, we got to have the available power that the Holy Spirit offers us. Let me ask you a couple of questions. You and I encounter all the people all the time whose world is falling apart. We come across people all the time who they're going through crisis, they're in chaos. And sometimes those people will tell you, and most of the time they won't. And most of us don't have a clue what to do when we encounter those people. So most people just keep their pain and their brokenness, brokenness to themselves. And some of those people are in the room right now. And let's just acknowledge that. There's people in the room, and you know what I'm talking about because you're living it right now. Let me ask you a couple of questions. What if you and I truly understood that where we are at any moment in time is strategic? 
strategic. What if you and I could respond to those seemingly hopeless situations in other people's lives in a way that brought them into contact with the supernatural love of God? What if that whole encounter just felt natural and normal and did not freak you out? (laughs) Would that interest you? Would you like to be that kind of person in your world? That when you encounter these seemingly hopeless situations, you understand that you are strategically there in that moment for such a time as this, and you have a way to move, empowered by the Holy Spirit, where you're like, okay, God's got this, but I'm the person that is here in this moment. That's what I want to talk about today. I want to give you three things. I want to give you, what am I going to give you? I'm going to give you an invitation. No, I'm going to give you a truth. I'm going to give you a truth about where you are, an invitation for how you operate, and then a question to ask when you're face-to-face with hopelessness. Would you pray with me and pray for me? God, thank you for your word this morning. I believe there's something here, God, that you want to impart to people, and we want to be ready for whatever it is that you want to speak directly to us. So we ask a few things. We pray, God, that you would reveal who you are. Your character and your nature would come so clear to us because we want to know you better. I pray that you'd remind us who we are because we can get so confused. we got a whole world that tells us who we are, and so much of it is untrue. So remind us who we are from your perspective. Would you show us Jesus because he's the one that we adore. He is the one that we are pursuing. He is the one who changes our lives. We want to know Jesus today. And let your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 All right, we're going to start in the book of Luke, chapter 10. If you've got a Bible, open it up. If you've got a device, if you don't have a, a Bible app, I recommend the Bible app you version Bible app on your, it's so awesome. It's got all the versions that you could ever possibly want. Super easy to search for a scripture. I have like verses not completely memorized, but like I kind of know what they are and I can just type it in and go, yeah, that's the verse. Bible app is a great one. If you don't have a Bible, just shoot your hand up. We've got ushers that'll just give you one to take home with you. Um, You don't even have to return it next week. It's like yours to keep. All right, Luke 10 verses one to 11. And then I've got two other short verses right after that I want to share with you. This is about Jesus appointing, sending out his disciples on their mission. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it'll return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town we wipe from our our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near you. Two more verses I want to share with you that we're going to talk about today. Colossians 1.27 says this, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Underline that, highlight it. Galatians 5.25, Since we live by the Spirit... Let us keep in step with the Spirit. All right, let's talk about those. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have been strategically placed. Say this with me. I am strategically placed. I am strategically placed. It's true. Let's look at this verse again, and I'll break this down. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others, and he sent them two by two ahead of him, to every town and place where he was about to go. That's the strategy. Jesus sends us out into a world that is 
desperately in need of him, and we are strategically placed. We go ahead of Jesus into the lives of the towns and, and to bring Jesus. We, we go ahead of where he is going. And then there's the destination. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. That destination is the harvest. There is a world that needs Jesus, and that harvest is plentiful. And I'm not a farmer. There might be some in the room, but I understand this, that when the harvest is ready, either you reap it now, or it's ruined by weather or withering. You can't just delay the harvest. It's, when it's time, it's time. And then there's the encounter. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it'll return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking, whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you, heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. I'm going to give you a sentence that I think encapsulates this mission that we, that we have and that we see in this chapter in Luke 10. It's this, we are sent by Jesus to look for seemingly hopeless situations where the supernatural love of God can be applied, giving faith and opportunity. Okay, break this down. because that's a, that's a mouthful, but this is what you see. You see Jesus sending out his disciples, the 72. He s- sends them out, and he, he places them. He is strategically placing them into the communities around them. We are sent by Jesus. Our assignment is this, to look for those seemingly hopeless situations. He says, look for someone Look for someone who's aware that God is at work, this person of peace, or is aware that they need God's peace. That word peace is shalom. It's this love and loyalty with God and with one another. So we're to look for those seemingly hopeless situations. And then he says, just to eat with them, hang out with them, get to know them, hear their stories, and learn what what they're all about. Fellowship with them. And then As you're fellowshipping with them, you're going to discover that seemingly hopeless situation. And then pray for them. See their prayer answered and bring that supernatural love of God into their reality. And then declare to them the kingdom of God. So if you and I are sent by Jesus and we're out to look for those seemingly hopeless situations, and when we encounter them, we realize that God put us there. We're strategically placed there. We hang out with those people and we meet them. We get to know their story. We find out what it is that they need. And then we pray and we see God meet their point of need. We're declaring the kingdom of God to them. That's what I'm talking about. You're strategically placed. Jerry Cook, in his book, Monday Morning Church, talks about strategic placement like this. He says, the first step is to recognize your strategic placement. Strategic placement means this. Each redeemed, spirit-filled Christian has been strategically placed by Jesus, the Lord of the church, where each believing man or woman lives and works as part of that strategy. Christians are people of destiny, purposely placed deep in our culture. We are God's points of penetration. Because of us, Jesus is present at the very heart of society, and it is this strategic presence of Jesus Christ that opens the door for his revelation as Savior to man. There's a cool picture here that's going on. See, we could walk in here and say, all right, the the objective is to get more people. We've got some extra seats, so the objective is to get more people in the building. It's an ineffective and inefficient strategy. A better strategy is to say that where you live, where you work, the people you go to school with, the people in your sphere of influence that encounter you every day, that's strategic. You're behind enemy lines. You are in a place in a position to bring the hope of Jesus to the people you encounter. Trying to get them in here, I mean, that's good. It's not a bad thing because that means there's more people sent out, but you going to where they are, that's strategic placement. Where you live is by Jesus' design. Where you work isn't an accident. The classroom that you are in isn't just random. You're strategically placed. So, do you know your neighbors, your coworkers, your classmates? Do you know their names? 
Do you know their stories? Could you ask Jesus for encounters this week, the people that you are going to be around? What would happen if you just said, Jesus, help me to know who these people are because you placed me here. Susie and I lived in Bothell for 20 years, and this is not a joke. The 13, first 13 years, I never knew the people that lived behind us. And then we were replacing our fence, and I said, I guess it's time for me to meet these people because we got to share this fence. And I met Rob and Janine. And what, <laughs> they were there the whole time. But Rob and Janine and Bob and Susie have probably about 25 to 30 friends in common, mutual friends on Facebook. They attended a four-square church in Everett. We were on staff at a four-square church in Bothell, and we knew like so many of the same people. And for 13 years, I never never went to go meet them, wow. and they live right behind us. Wow. <laughs> okay, I stunk at meeting my neighbors. <laughs> That's horrible, but it's the truth. We moved from Bothell in 2019 to Richland, Tri-Cities, and I aimed to do a little bit better job of this, meeting my neighbors. And I met Hunter on our left, Mike and Nana on our right, and then Ron and Lisa across the street, and then COVID, <laughs> and it was really hard to meet people beyond the, the immediate people around me, but I, I got to meet them, and, and I'll tell you what happened, is I discovered the best neighbors in the world, Ron and Lisa across the street, such dear friends. I was even texting him today, saying, letting him know that just how important their, their relationship has been. And then we moved from Richland here to Yelm, and... Uh, I want you to get, no, I'm getting better. Been in our neighborhood for a little over a month, and I know the names of five households in a month and a half. That's more than ever. Like, that's a big deal, you guys. I share that to say that, like, this is hard. We, we love, we, we just went through two years of isolation, so we're kind of accustomed to, like, just me. I'm going to close the garage door, go inside, not talk to anybody. I don't want to, but just... Begin by asking the Lord to introduce you to the people around you. Just take it one step at a time and ask for encounters where you can just, just get to know who they are. And then when you see them again, you say hi. You say, hi, Clarencia, my next door neighbor. <laughs> hey, Gary, across the street. And you just begin, right? It takes time. I'm not asking you to go and like witness to them in the first 30 minutes and get them to say, like, no, just be a normal neighbor. Just get to know their stories because you're strategically placed. Yeah. So the truth that I've shared with you is that you and I are intentionally and strategically placed by Jesus in our world. However, it does no good to be strategically placed if we aren't open for business. As spirit-filled followers of Jesus, we are invited to be open for business. Say this, I am open for business. Open for business. All right. You all know what it's like to go to a store that's closed. Chick-fil-A on a Sunday afternoon is closed. <laughs> Breaks my heart. I like it when a business is open for business when I'm looking for business, right? Colossians 1.27. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory, means that you are filled with the Holy Spirit and Jesus is present wherever you go. You are capable of responding to the needs of others exactly the way Jesus would. The gifts of the Spirit are how Jesus works through you to touch people's lives. My friend Jerry Cook said that. He also said this, I'm convinced that if more Christians would get open for business, then more business would begin showing up. Right? Yeah. <laughs> We're open for business. Okay, here's the deal. We encounter hundreds of situations that are so unwhole, so desperate, that are so painful. Don't you wish in those moments that somebody, that Jesus would come along, Jesus would be there for that person, that situation, that hopeless moment? We're like, Jesus, come be with this person. Hello? He's there. You're there. You bring Jesus into that situation, into that hopeless moment, into that encounter. Jesus placed you there, and he has placed his Holy Spirit in you to be that person on site, to be his presence 
for that hopeless situation. Where you are, He is. Where you are, He is. So be the active presence of Jesus. Be filled with the Spirit and understand that all of His intentions and purposes that will meet every situation are resident with you. That's why you're on sight. This is not in my notes, but I'm looking around the room right now and I'm looking at some of the people I've met over the last month and a half. And I'm just considering how I see Jesus in you. And I think about the fact, I don't know what circumstances you're in, what sphere of influence you have, but I think about this, that, man, Jesus looks so good on you. I see him in you. And when you shine with his radiance, his presence, his love, his joy, you show up really good. People see that, and they want to know the Jesus that you love. And you have a capacity to bring his presence to people that are so hurt, so broken, so hopeless. And there's people in this room that need you to do that for them. They're in that place right now today, and they need you to bring the presence of Jesus to them because they're hurting today right here. Okay, tomorrow's a Monday. I want you to think right now about where you're going tomorrow. Think through your schedule. Think about your day, who you'll meet, where you'll go. Can you think about that right now? Some of you have no clue what you're doing tomorrow. You're like, I don't know. It's a Monday already? I want you to anticipate the conversations you might have. Okay, think about that. Where are you going to go? Who are you going to meet? What kind of conversations are you going to have? And then ask Jesus to help you be open for business and ready to respond to the needs he brings your way. That's something you can do as you're driving to work. You just go, okay, this is the day I've got. These are the conversations I'm going to have. Jesus, help me to be open for business and ready to respond to the needs you bring my way. This is my daily prayer. I kind of base it on 1 Corinthians 14, 3. I say this. I say, Jesus, today I'm open for business to exhort, to edify, to encourage, to equip, to strengthen, to comfort whoever you bring across my path. And some days I mean it. (laughs) That was a joke. Some days I pray it. But when I pray that and I mean it, God answers that prayer, and there's moments that that are pretty incredible. Let me share one with you. What's the best thing that happened to you today? I asked that question to my barista a few weeks ago. Walked into a a store and uh, met this young lady. Her name's Rihanna. And I looked at her and I said, what's the best thing that happened to you today? And I was like, not medium best, like best is best. What's the best thing that happened to you today? And she's all flustered because pe- normal people don't ask questions like I do. <laughs> they don't. And she's all flustered. And, and then I, I look behind me and I play with her a little bit. Like, There's a huge lane behind me. Come on, hurry up, answer. What's, what's the best thing that happened to you today? There's nobody behind me. I'm just playing with her. And she goes, huh? I woke up today. And I said, I'm so glad you did. I bet there's a lot of people that would miss you if you hadn't woken up today. I wouldn't have had a chance to meet you. I'm so glad you woke up today. I said, I can tell you really enjoy serving people. There's joy all over your face. (laughs) She's like, you're going to make me cry. (laughs) I'm going, yeah. (laughs) I high-fived her. I said, you're awesome. I did what my friend Kenny Maurer does. Kenny, Kenny's that guy who'll just meet somebody for the first time and just go, you're awesome. I think we all need a Kenny Maurer in our life. Somebody just to come along and say, you're awesome. You're awesome. You're awesome. A couple weeks later, I go back to the same store and she's there and I meet her coworker, Bree, and Rihanna walks over and says to Bree, says, oh, this is the guy who almost made me cry a couple weeks ago. <laughs> He asked me how I was doing, and then he was like, how are you really doing? You know, it didn't take but a few minutes. It was just me showing up, asking a question, and being open for business. You can do that. You're awesome. All of you. Where you are, he is. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So if we understand that we're strategically placed and we make a daily decision to be open for business, 
how in the world are we going to know what to do when we encounter that hopeless situation? All right, I'm strategically placed. I'm open for business. Yikes, now what? We allow the Holy Spirit to lead. I mean, that's the secret weapon. You and I are empowered with the Holy Spirit. Say this with me. I am allowing Holy Spirit to lead. Galatians 5.25 says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That phrase, keep in step, is stoicheo. That's the Greek. And anybody who has uh, served in the military, you've been through basic training? Anybody? Anyone? Yeah, I did not, but there's some people in the room that have, and you know exactly what that means to keep in step, right? Um, I wasn't in the military, but I was in marching band, and we learned how to, <laughs> how to march eight steps to every five yards, you're in step, and if you're out of step, Harry Fankston would blow his whistle and yell at you and call you out, keep in step. This idea of keeping in step with the Holy Spirit is this marching in rank, keeping, uh, conforming to the, the virtue and the piety to walk orderly. It means all of those things, keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit for a minute. When Jesus came back to life and rose to heaven, he didn't leave his followers alone. He promised to send the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit goes by many names, comforter, advocate, spirit of truth. He's the third person of the Trinity, and he's the one who empowers us to be the presence of Jesus in our world. All right, a couple of scriptures about the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16 to 17, this is Jesus talking. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Check this out. I want you guys to get this. The same Holy Spirit that lived in Jesus, operated in Jesus, that motivated Jesus, gave Jesus the power to heal people, to set people free, to cast out demons, to set the oppressed people free, that Holy Spirit lives in you. Check that out. Same Holy Spirit. Not a different Holy Spirit. There's some kids in the room. You don't got a junior Holy Spirit. You get the same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus. <laughs> Holy Spirit in you is the same Holy Spirit that operated in Jesus. And Jesus promised this in Acts 1.8. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the experience that Jesus promised in Acts 1.8 is available to every follower of Jesus and once again, it's, an addition, it's in addition to and separate from our salvation experience. It is that moment when we say, Jesus, baptize me with your Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And the evidence that we see is this power and this boldness to express Jesus, to be Jesus to the world around you with the boldness that you need, to have the empowerment with the gifts that you need, to know what to do because you're operating the same way Jesus would in that moment. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, if you haven't asked Jesus to baptize you with the Holy Spirit, let me ask this question. What might you still need? Do you need an opportunity? I mean, that may be it. It's like I just, I never asked. Well, today's a great day to ask. I mean, we've got some time. I'll hang out here afterwards. We have a prayer team. If you would like to ask Jesus to baptize you with the Holy Spirit, Today's a great day. You don't need somebody else. You can just ask him. That's how I did it. Just hanging out in my bedroom, just praying. Okay, Jesus, baptize me with your Holy Spirit. Do you need further understanding? I think that's a great, a great reason to wait. It's like, I don't get this. I don't understand. Ask questions. This is a safe place to learn. I'm a co-learner with you. There's a lot that I don't understand. Let's figure it out together. Ask questions. Is it is it you need a release from fear, from confusion, previous negative experience? Oh, man, I, there was some wacky stuff that happened a few years ago, and I'm not so sure I want to go down that road again. That's legit. That's like a real reason. Let's work through that. Let's ask Jesus to identify whatever that obstacle is and to bring healing because he wants to do that. As Jesus followers, we are people who believe in the imminent presence of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. 
We also believe that through the Holy Spirit, every gift of the Spirit is resident within us. And whatever he wants to call forth at whatever time in any situation for any purpose, we're perfectly and fully equipped to get that call. Okay, I'm going to give you something really practical. When we encounter a seemingly hopeless situation, we can respond the way Jesus did. What did Jesus do? We get to that situation and we go, what, would, what, what, what are you going to do, Jesus, in this situation? Well, what did he do? How did he respond when he encountered people that were so broken, so hurting, so filled with pain? What was his response? He asked a question. Is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything I can do for you? That's all you do. You ask the Jesus question. It doesn't take 15 weeks of advanced Bible study to ask this question. You don't have to be a Christian for 15 years. You don't have to have all of your problems solved to ask somebody, is there anything I can do for you? That's the question that releases the life and ministry and gifts of the Holy Spirit into your everyday world. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. That means that Jesus is present, and that means that when you ask the Jesus question, you're fully equipped and capable of responding exactly the way Jesus would. Okay, a few weeks ago, I went and got a haircut and uh, walked in and met Cole. He was my stylist. And um, I asked Cole how he was, and I could tell he was lying to me. He wasn't fine. No, in fact, I, and I pressed a little, what's, what's going on? And he just shared with me that um, his uh, aunt and uncle were just in a motorcycle accident, and um, I think the uncle was maybe going to make it through, but he wasn't sure about his aunt. It didn't look good. And then he explained further, and he said, I've had five people very close to me die in the last three months. And yesterday was my best friend's funeral. And this morning I woke up to this call from my mom about my aunt and my uncle. I didn't need to think very much about why Jesus placed me in Cole's seat that morning. I just knew that that's where I needed to be. I was strategically placed. And then I was open for business, and I just, I'm so sorry. And I just listened. And I had a dual conversation. I'm talking to Cole, and I'm talking to the Holy Spirit. And this dual conversation is like, okay, what do I need to ask next? Do I need to change the topic? Because this is just getting really deep and hard, or do I need to offer some words of comfort? And then when the haircut was over, I just, it was so simple. I just said to Cole, I said, I'm going to be praying for you. And he appreciated that. He'll never know that this is going on right now, but could we just take a minute and just pray for Cole? Jesus, would you, would you really be present in Cole's life? Bring him comfort. He's hurting. And I pray that he would just really sense your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen. Is there anything I can do for you? That's the Jesus question. You and I have an opportunity to be strategically placed, open for business, and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead tomorrow night. I don't know if you know this, but tomorrow is Halloween, and it's that one night of the year where people will come to your door and have conversation with you. You don't have to go looking for them. They ring the doorbell, and they stand right there, and they want things from you. But there's an opportunity there for you to be light. We've done this for years at the previous churches that I've been a part of. It, just call it Light the Night, but it just is simply this, is, is being home and being present and being open for business when people come to your, to your house. We'll do this tomorrow night. We're gonna go, I'm going to go buy a, a, a fire pit, put it in the, in the driveway, have a little bonfire, bring out some camp chairs, have some coffee and cider and maybe some s'mores and, of course, candy, one year, I even drug out a TV and put like a kid's movie on in the garage, brought out a table with a bunch of Legos, and like kids are like, this is the best place in the world. <laughs> Parents are like, 
is not so bad, all right, get warmed up, get some coffee. Then they're like, um, we've got like another like eight blocks to do, kid, let's move on. They're like, no, I'm having too much fun. But while they're there, I'm just talking to them. I'm just getting to know, I met some of my neighbors that way. I get to know what their story is and introduce them. And then they know like, there's some nice people that live in this house. I'm not doing anything out of the ordinary. I'm not preaching. I'm just being open for business, allowing the Holy Spirit to lead. It may just be the opportunity you have to meet the people on your block where you actually get to put names to faces that you just kind of wave or ignore as you're driving by. <laughs> be open for business. I want to give you a little bit of further practice. We're strategically placed. We're open for business. We're allowing the Holy Spirit to lead. And this is our final message in this series. I want to just bring it all together I believe God is always speaking to us. We just rarely choose to sit still and listen. So I want you just right now in this moment to just sit still, listen. You can close your eyes. This, is, this won't be too weird. Just might just push you a little bit out of your comfort zone, but, but let's just sit and listen. I believe that God often places names and faces on our hearts. Those impressions are frequently from him, and he wants to use us to strengthen and encourage and comfort those people when they come to mind. I want you right now, just in your own mind, ask God right now who he wants to strengthen, encourage, or comfort through you. And let's specify for our purposes that this is someone you have a healthy friendship or family relationship with. Just ask God, who does he want you to strengthen, encourage, or comfort? Trust that he's going to bring a name or a face to your mind. You've asked him a question. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt that he's answering. Raise your hand if someone came to your mind already. Good. Hands all over the room. Sweet. Okay, now we're going to ask God what his thoughts are about that person. A few weeks ago, we talked about prophecy, and I said that prophecy is really just seeing, hearing, speaking from God's perspective, what he's done, what he's doing, what he'll do. Jeff Eggers has a great book called Prophetic Like Jesus, and he gives two pieces of solid advice when we seek to hear God's voice for ourselves and others. He does, says this, here's the first one, dial it down and don't try so hard. Instead of struggling to receive a gift and get a word, think of prophecy as an extension of your vertical prayer life with God. In your fellowship with God, he talks and you listen, and you talk and he listens. You don't have to struggle and strain to talk to him and receive from him. The second thing is, is ask God specific questions. Some people don't hear from God because they ask in such a general way, they wouldn't recognize the answer if it came to them. We can say, speak to me, God, and he might answer, well, which of the hundred billions of bits of information that are before me at any moment in time do you want me to share with you? It's like those of us that have teenage kids, it's like if your kid were to come in and say, Dad, I have an unspecified request for an undefined activity, can you help me out? <laughs> what? But if your kid says, Dad, I need 10 bucks to go to a movie, you'd say, you need 20. <laughs> He's like, oh yeah, I can help you with that. So here's some specific questions to ask God about the person he brought to your mind. How do you want to encourage this person today? God, how do you want to encourage this person today? Here's another one. Jesus, if you were standing in front of them right now, what would you want to say to them? What scriptures do you want to share with them? I like this one. What do you love about this person? Okay, the person that the Holy Spirit has brought to your mind, ask one or more of those questions right now. And then there's a connect card or a piece of paper in front of you. You got a device, reach it and grab it and write down what you hear right now. Right now, write down what you hear, what you sense. Ask God one or more of those specific questions. Write down what you hear, what you sense, what comes to mind. Give God the benefit of the doubt. So often we're like, and there's some of you right now that aren't doing what I said because doubt is riddling your mind. And you're like, I don't know. Trust God. You asked him a question. He's bringing something to your mind right now. He brought a name. He brought a face. And now he's going to answer one of those questions for you right now. Just jot it down. It could be super simple. If it doesn't strengthen, encourage, or comfort, throw it out. 
If it's corrective, highly directive, or judgmental, set it aside. Let God call out the gold he sees in them. Okay? Giving you some time and space right now. Write down what you hear. Some of you are doing it. And again, this is a get-to, not a have-to. I'm not forcing anybody's hand, but I do believe there's somebody right now that their encouragement, their strength, their comfort is tied to you hearing God's voice, taking a risk, and writing it down. It's like when I sat in Cole's seat to get my hair cut. I just knew God placed me there. This is a moment for me just to encourage him, just to be present, to be Jesus in that moment. Okay. Now comes a little bit more risk. If we're to be the active presence of Jesus, we need the available power of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to have some time of worship. In fact, the worship team can just come on up here while I finish this up and pray for you. But I want to have you, I want to give you the, the opportunity and the freedom right now. If the person that you, that the Lord brought to mind is in this room, I want to give you just opportunity just to go to them and just share with them what you heard. You can ask them and say, hey, can I share with you what I think I heard from God for you? And if they say yes, share with them what you heard. If the person's not in the room, shoot them a text right now. Hey, I'm practicing hearing God's voice for other people, and I think God said something to me about you. Would you like to hear it? I bet you they'll say yes. Tell me if I'm wrong. So we're going to move into a time of worship, but if that person is here in the room, you're free to just walk right over to them and just show them what you wrote, hand them a card, and just say, does this encourage you? Jesus brought you to my mind. There might be people that are going to get a bunch of texts right now from you because you just said, all right, trust you, God. I feel like this person needs to hear this word. Jesus, thank you for strategically placing us in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our schools. Thank you, God, that you are inviting us to be open for business. All we have to do is say, I'm open, I'm ready, and we can trust you, Holy Spirit, to lead allow you to lead us into those conversations into sharing encouraging words into being the presence of Jesus we love you you should go ahead and stand like I said if there's somebody that you need to walk over to now's your time go ahead and walk around talk to them we're going to play for a minute and then we're going to worship and and some of us are going to have chicken after church. God bless you.
clothed in rainbows. God, thank you that there is a day coming when you are going to set up your reign and rule over this world and make everything new. In this moment, you've sent your church, the bride of Christ, people that you dearly love and died on a cross, rose again from the grave and empowered us with your Holy Spirit to be the active presence of of you, Jesus, in the world. Empower us by your spirit as we leave this place today and the people we encounter even in the next 30 minutes that we would be your presence to them whatever their need is. You've strategically placed us. May we be open for business and allow your Holy Spirit to lead in Jesus' mighty name. Everyone said, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for worshiping with us. Thanks for being here. If you've got a few minutes and you want to hang out, we're going to set some tables up right here so that some of us...